Well, you keep hearing me say pray for the sick um, the, who are not among us, and I'm not trying to be coy about that. Uh, one of the, one of those would be Hunter, and uh, p- please pray for him and his family playing it safe at home. Uh, he was going to be preaching today, and so he'll be preaching, Lord willing, next week if he has a timely recovery. He was going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 21, but sort of late this week he said, I don't feel well, and then he took a test and actually tested positive for COVID, so let's be praying for him. Um, And so it fell upon me, and it's a joy to preach, but I did not have a sermon ready on that Thursday uh, evening. And so what I'm doing is I'm going back, and you've heard me, if you've been trekking through the book of Acts with us, then you've heard me mention go back and listen to a sermon out of Romans 14 or 1 Corinthians 9 because we keep seeing this steady drumbeat in the book of Acts of uh, the apostles, particularly Paul, making what would seem like random decisions of do I observe this festival, do I keep this vow, do I keep this holy day, Um, He did not circumcise Titus. He did circumcise Timothy. And and there's there's on-the-fly decisions that they're having to make. And we might look into that and go, "How, how did they make those decisions? Or what was their conscience like? And so in Romans 14, that'll be our main text today. So if you want to go ahead and turn there. Um, A couple of years ago, we were going through the Bible in a year. And I heard a lot of feedback from many of you from the sermon on 1 Corinthians 9, which we're going to tap into that briefly, but mainly Romans 14, that this helped you in your uh, everyday decision making of how to have a a biblically informed conscience so that um, it's lined up as best as it can be with God's word and that that acts as sort of a compass in your life in those gray areas where the Bible doesn't say, you know, you should date this person, you shouldn't date this person, you should go to this movie, you shouldn't go to this movie, Um, you should spend this amount of money on a car, you shouldn't spend this amount of money on a car. And so that's what we're going to do. And again, it does tie back to the book of Acts because in the book of Acts you will see decisions made of, of certain liberties and we just don't know exactly how or why they were thinking the way they were thinking, but this might help us to see into that. Did you know I read a study recently that says the average human makes about 35,000 decisions a day. Now, I'm, obviously that's, do I eat chocolate ice cream or strawberry ice cream? And I don't know, ask John Dillard, he's the ice cream expert. Chocolate, there it is. So that's one decision you you won't have to make anymore because it's been made for you. 35,000 decisions daily. No wonder we sometimes uh, wish that God would, would just write out a blueprint for everything that we should do, but he hasn't done that per se. But he has given us his word, he's given us his spirit, and he's given us a conscience. So would you stand, Romans 14, and just let God's word wash over you and pray as you read, pray for yourself, pray for me, and then we'll pray formally at the end. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions, One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he is, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand." One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who eats does it for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God as well. 
For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you, again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put a stumbling block, an obstacle in another brother's way. I know I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we pursue the things which may for peace, make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is, a, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But if he doubts, excuse me, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. You may be seated. And again, may God help us as we unpack this. If you go back to our sermon archives, you'll see on November 15th, 2020, that might be a way to help you find it, but there's a sister sermon to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I just don't have time to pack two sermons into one. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9, November 15th, 2020, um, I will bring out one point from that message, but... If, if this is helping you, then go back and listen to that. All right. So let me get my timer set up here. All right. J.I. Packer defines the conscience as God's watchman and spokesman in the soul. Andy Nacelli and Mr. Dr. Crowley, they wrote a book on the conscience, very good book, I commend it to you, it says your, conscient, uh, your conscience is what you believe to be right and wrong. And this Greek word occurs over 30, or your consciousness, excuse me, is what you believe to be right and wrong, uh, occurs over 30 times in the New Testament. Uh, Nacelli says our conscience is a gift from God. We should obey it unless it is clearly out of line with Scripture. Let me say that again. We should obey it unless it is clearly out of line with Scripture. We should not push it on others. We should exercise grace and love and patience toward those who differ. And we should always be seeking to recalibrate our conscience, to weed out the man-made traditions so that it is in line with the scripture. And that, by the way, is going to be a lifelong process. Lifelong process. If you've ever gone to the emergency room, you understand the word triage, right? Because you, you get in to the place and it's packed and uh, you've got, you know, a thumb that's bleeding, but you got it bandaged up. And so you're there for a while, and then someone comes, and they get pushed to the front of the line. And you at first think, why did he get in front of me? But then you look a little more carefully, and he has a nail sticking through his head, right? He gets ushered to the front because in triage, you have to prioritize things. First level, second level, third level. So it is with our consciences. 
Let me give you an example. Here's a first level issue. If we disagree here, we miss heaven. The person and work of Christ, the sinlessness of Christ, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, the resurrection of Christ. These are things that you and I just cannot afford to disagree on. If we do, one of us is going to miss heaven, right? Uh, second level issues. Here we have some room to disagree. We have fellowship here on earth and we'll have fellowship in heaven, but we're going to disagree a little bit. Baptism, the extent of God's sovereignty in salvation, eschatology, when is Jesus coming? Will we be here for the tribulation or not? Those are second level issues. We can disagree here and still be brothers and sisters in Christ. And then there are third level issues. Again, we can disagree and be brothers and sisters in Christ, but these are of even more minimal importance. Let me give you several. Entertainment, video games, movies, music, sports. How much time to devote to each of these? Can you watch an R-rated movie? Secular music, modesty. Uh, what is modest enough? Tithing versus grace giving and how much do we give? Participating in a holiday such as Halloween, taking care of our environment, birth control, hysterectomy, vasectomy, education, homeschool, public school, Christian school, mandatory masks or not. And I'm not talking about for Halloween. Do we have the vaccine or not? Do we raise our hands in worship or not? Do we have a choir? Do we have solos? Do we have specials? The list goes on and on, and we may disagree on more than you realized. But on these disagreements, what is clear is they are not salvific. They're not heaven and hell issues. And as a foreshadowing into our sermon, who is the strong brother or sister in these disagreements? And who is the weak brother or sister in these disagreements? See, even that is a matter of interpretation, isn't it? Because you may have your set of preferences and be sitting high on the mountaintop saying, I'm the strong brother that Paul's referring to in Romans 14. And those who disagree with you might be doing the exact same thing. So in our text here in Romans 14, let's start with the similarities between this, these two groups. Both groups are brothers in Christ. Surely you picked up on that when we read through it. They're believers for whom Christ died. Both the strong and the weak, the one who could eat meat and the one who said, no, I'm not eating that meat. It might have been sacrificed to idols. See, this isn't just the Atkins diet plan. This is, I don't want to touch that stuff because it might have been contaminated and sacrificed to idols. And the other says, it's just meat. And there's only one God. It's free to, I'm free to eat that meat. Pass the, pass the pork. So they're both brothers in Christ both brothers for whom Christ died. And did you notice they're both doing what they're doing or not doing what they're not doing for the glory of God with thanksgiving. One says, I'm going to eat that meat for the glory of God. I'm going to give him thanks for this meat. The other one says, I'm not going to eat that meat. I'm going to eat the vegetables. And in not eating that meat, I believe I'm glorifying God. Now, let's look at their differences, although I just sort of alluded to those as well. The differences are, Paul says one of these is a strong brother, one is a weak brother. Notice they're both brothers. One is a meat eater and one is a vegetable eater, and I've given you a little bit of background on that. Just to go a little deeper, the weak was probably the Jewish Christian who was having difficulty letting go of food laws. 
And the strong was probably a Gentile Christian who had no such background and no such baggage. Listen to what Nacelli says about that. He says, um, The one passage in Romans in which it appears that Paul has a specific problem in mind, uh, he, rebu he rebukes two groups for their intolerance toward each other. The weak in faith probably Jewish Christians, and the strong in faith, probably Gentile Christians. The rebuke focuses on the Gentile Christians who are becoming arrogant toward the shrinking minority of Jewish Christians. So one of Paul's purposes in writing this letter was to heal the division in the Christian community in Rome. The weak were influenced by a Jewish tradition of asceticism based on the Torah. Jewish Christians in Rome convinced that the Torah was still authoritative for Christians, claimed that a sincere Christian should avoid meat and wine and should observe the Sabbath and Jewish holy days. And only by following such practices could a Christian avoid ritual contamination and thus please God. Had the two sides been content to live with their differences, Paul might never have felt the need to write Romans 14. But human nature being what it is, some from both sides went too far and began to impose their freedoms on others. All right, so I hope you're clear with what's going on there. Look at verse 3 again. This is the temptation. For the strong to be arrogant and flaunt his freedom, I have the right to eat meat, and those who disagree are in error, and they need to grow up and get with the program. And the temptation was for the weak to be judgmental of the strong. It is sinful to eat meat. That meat might have been offered to idols. You're not being faithful to God. You're not being careful for your brother. So look at verse 3 again. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt. That's the pride. That word means to look down upon. The one who does not eat meat. And the one who does not eat meat is not to judge the one who eats meat. For God has accepted him. Now, this could take more time than I'm wanting to give to it, but... So far, both sides, Christians, preferences, I'm free to eat, I'm not free to eat, but you, you notice sin is beginning to creep in at this point. At that point, there's no sin, but the sin is now becoming being prideful and arrogant and being judgmental. And another sin that was creeping at the door was taking these liberties too far into a heretical position. Let me just briefly share with you this. Nacelli says, disunity wasn't the only danger. Seeds of outright heresy began to germinate on both sides of the controversy. In Corinth, some of the believers with a strong conscience grew overconfident and had the gall to accept invitations to the banqueting halls that were connected to pagan worship. All right. And then also on the other side, the weak believers were tempted. It says, uh, but the strict fell into heresies as well. In Galatia, some of the strict believers went so far as to insist that if people didn't obey the Mosaic food laws and circumcision laws, they couldn't be Christians at all. So I'm wanting you to be aware of the, of the potential dangers. At, at one level, there's nothing wrong at all. Preferences. I choose to not eat meat. I choose to eat meat. But that quickly escalated into arrogance and judgmentalism. And then if unchecked, this freedom was taken to an extreme position of heresy. I can go to the pagan temples and worship with the pagans and 
worship with their gods being celebrated, which is heresy and, and sin in the worst of ways. And then on the other side, the group says, well, actually, if you don't eat this meat or that meat, uh, if you're not circumcised, then you are not a Christian at all. Now, here's what's fascinating about this chapter. Paul could have leaned in with his apostolic weight, and he could have just squashed this once and for all. He could have said, it's just meat. Everything is permissible. Grow up, weaker brother. Grow up. He could have done that. He doesn't do that. He could have said, you know, it's just meat. It's not worth even the possibility of causing another to stumble. Strong brother, spit out the meat. Don't ever eat it again. He doesn't do that. Here's what he does, and this is, this is fascinating, and this is going to help us in our daily walk with, with Christ and with one another. Instead of answering every objection and directing every scenario, the inspiration that the Holy Spirit gave to Paul shows us that God is more glorified in saying, work through your differences with grace, with wisdom, with acceptance and love, always welcoming your brother in Christ. That's fascinating to me. He could have made it, I guess we would say, easier, more black and white, but he doesn't. He says, you know what? You're going to work through this yourselves. And notice three verses that show this idea of welcoming your brother. Look at verse 1, Romans 14, 1. Now accept the one who is weak. That word accept means let him in your home. Literally, that's what it means. Let him in your home. It's also used again in this, in this passage. Look at verse 15 and verse 17. He says, For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now scroll down to chapter 15, and there's two verses here. We're going to look at verses 5. Well, three verses, five, six, and seven. Now, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept, there it is again, welcome him into your home, accept one another just as Christ also accepted, literally, he welcomed us into his home, um, accepted us to the glory of God. So that's, that's huge, guys. God had a chance here through Paul to just simplify things. But he says, no, I'm not going to simplify it and just tell you what to do every time. What I'm going to remind you of is that you have been accepted into Christ's arms by grace through faith. And now you are to work through your differences of conscience. And you're to accept them into your home. And you're to realize that's someone for whom Christ died. And I'm going to deal with you as I want you to deal with me. And that is with wisdom, with patience, with grace, with love. I want to read a few little excerpts from our church covenant. We've had some people leave our church over the past two, two years. And some of those departures were, we saw them coming. Um, they were good things. We could rally behind them. We could, we could put our arms around them. We could pray for them. It, we weren't really losing them. We were sending them off, right? But we've lost some in a way that I don't believe reflects what Romans 14 just told us to be about. Maybe I haven't done as good a job about teaching you about membership and the importance of membership and the importance of one anothering one another. 
But listen to, and, and this is said anytime someone joins our church, we say it to them and we say it to you. And there's a covenant of back and forth here. It says, uh, we'll say to this person, you know, do you covenant to love your new church family who will help you by providing a framework for fellowship and godly relationships. They will carry out their responsibility to reprove, exhort, care for, and if need be, to discipline. And will you covenant to love them by maintaining a good testimony and helping to preserve the unity of the church? And there's an I do and an I do, just like at a wedding. And at the bottom of the covenant, it says, and this speaks to our Romans 14 passage, it says, as a member of Providence Baptist, I will seek God's help in abstaining from anything which will harm the body or jeopardize my own personal faith. Where there involves a liberty of conscience issue, I will seek to use biblical wisdom and prayerful discretion so as not to cause another's faith to be jeopardized. When in doubt, I will approach a biblically qualified leader at Providence Baptist Church. And then once a month, we have the Lord's Supper and we renew our covenant together. And this is the one line I want you to remember. And you probably could quote it because if you've been here for a while, we say it 12 times a year. It says, we further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy of speech. Listen, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the commands of our Savior and to secure reconciliation without delay. I know that you and I do not agree on everything. If you think we do, then you don't know me that well. And if I think we do, then I don't know you that well. Again, there are some issues that we just can't afford to disagree on. They're gospel issues. They're heaven and hell issues. There's level two that's very important, but we would call those minor doctrines. We have some freedom to disagree on that and still get to heaven and fellowship for all of eternity. And then there's those third tertiary issues where we're going to disagree a lot. And I don't need to impose my conscience on you or vice versa. We need to be patient with each other. But in all of those ways, and in what we just read for our, through our covenant, we're to be welcoming one another into our homes, literally. We're to be reminded that Christ died for us. We belong to Him. Now, back to our text. I said a minute ago, who's the strong one? Who's the weak one? Well, in this one, it, he, he does differentiate, right? The one who was free to eat the meat, realizing it's just meat. There's just one God. It's not that idle. You can have the sandwich, the pork sandwich. He's the stronger one. The other one who says, oh, I, I don't know that I want that. I'd rather eat a salad. He's the weaker one. No one likes to be called weak. But let's remember this brother's salvation is not in question. His weakness shows up when he holds on to something that the Bible does not command him to hold on to. Let me say that again. His weakness shows up when he holds on to something that the Bible does not command him to hold. We all have weaknesses on some level. That's, the, that's a fact. We all do. The strong conscience is preferred because we want to align our thoughts as closely to God's character and God's words as possible. We want to hold tightly to that which God commands us to hold tightly, and we want to let go of that for which Christ has set us free. But this is a lifelong process, as I mentioned. Hold your finger in Acts, or excuse me, Romans 14. Turn to 1 Corinthians 9. I told you we were just going to get one point out of that passage. First Corinthians nine, and would you look at verses twenty-two and twenty-three? 
You'll notice Paul's using this same language, weak, strong. He's talking about the same idea that he's just referred to. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. See, here's where Paul sort of ups the ante. Up to this point, he's just thinking in terms of you yourself. Like, do you have a conscience that's clear to eat meat or not? He, he vaguely mentions it of don't cause others to stumble, but he doesn't dive headlong into that. But now he's saying, listen, this idea of recalibrating your conscience, it's not just about you. I don't want you to think in terms of what is permissible for me. What am I free to do? That's how you might have thought as an immature Christian. But as you begin to grow in Christ, I want you to have this mindset that what can I do to reach all people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? In other words, you need to come to a mindset where you think that though I'm free to do this, absolutely free in Christ, I have a strong conscience to do that. What will most advance the gospel of Christ, the kingdom of God? What will save the most? What will win the most? Nacelli calls it a sanctified flexibility. And this comes from spending time in the word of God, in prayer, alongside mature believers who are dying to their rights for the sake of the gospel of Christ. And it sort of becomes contagious This isn't exactly a one-to-one -one comparison, but uh, I told you an illustration one time where a friend of mine, he, he's a missionary. He thinks missiologically, and Amy got me the Chuck Norris Total Gym. All right, you can tell I've been using it. You know, you can tell I haven't been using it because of this story I'm about to tell you. So I was excited, got the Total Gym. I'm going to look like Chuck Norris. People say I already do a little bit with the beard. So, hey, let's go for the Total Package. And my friend, John, said, you're not going to get to share the gospel with anybody working out in your backyard. Why don't you sell that or get your wife to get a refund and you take that $300 that it costs and you go and buy a membership down the road at the local gym so that as you work out, you can lead people to Jesus. I, I wasn't thinking like that. So we did. I asked Amy if she would be offended if, I, if we sold it back, got the refund, and joined 24-7 down the road in Oakland, Tennessee. She said, no, I'm not offended at all. So we did that. That's kind of what Paul is getting at here. That's kind of what he's thinking. It's like, yeah, you got the right to work out in your backyard. It's your backyard. It's your body. You got the right to do that. But you know, if you did this, you could work out alongside unbelievers and plant a seed, invite them to church, pray for them, perhaps share the gospel with them. I don't have time to get into all of the ways that Paul did that and showed us that. Let me just give you one illustration that, that could help you. Nacelli again says this. He says, at some point in Paul's life, he must have prayed something like this. God, it's time for you to weed the garden of my conscience. It's time for me to bring my conscience under your lordship. I'm no longer the Lord of my conscience. God, show me the laws that are missing from my conscience and the man-made weeds that I need to uproot. So one by one, he started making decisions about what stayed and what went. The prohibition against eating pork. Jesus said in Mark 7 that such a prohibition was no longer a matter of right and wrong. It was just a matter of preferences. Do you think this was easy for Paul to make the switch? I bet it wasn't, but Paul still obeyed. 
Special holy days, out they go. Whether I observe holy days or not is no longer a conscience issue, but a matter of wisdom and love and of gospel witness. He says, Eat pork if it advances the gospel. Stop eating pork if it advances the gospel. Celebrate a Jewish holy day. Sure, when I'm in Jerusalem... Abstain from wine or meat sacrificed to idols? No problem. If partaking might embolden my brother with a weak conscience in those areas to sin, Paul became someone who could glide from culture to culture, making nearly seamless transitions without att attracting attention to himself because it was not about him. It was about Christ and the gospel and the eternal souls of men and women. Do you think like that? Do you have a zeal for Christ and for others to enjoy Christ as you enjoy Christ? As such a zeal that says, though I'm free in Christ, I'm a slave to God and I'm a slave to the lost. I can restructure my life and the freedoms around my life so that they revolve around Christ, not me. I want to be the least bit offensive with my preferences so that I may earn the right to share the gospel, which I know will necessarily offend. I want to be so wise and loving as to which hills I die on. In fact, I want to die on the same hill that Christ died on. I want to die on a gospel issue, not preference issues. And I will dig my heels in on the gospel and not back up or shut up. But on these preference issues, I'll die to myself there. And that's what Romans 15 says. Go back to 15, 5 and 6. It says, now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one accord to Christ Jesus. So that with one accord, he uses that phrase twice. Our one accord at Providence Baptist. What is our one accord? I've been a part of some churches before that were known as the homeschool churches. Nothing wrong with homeschooling. We homeschooled our children until they were ninth grade. And then we came here to Rome and went to Unity. But I've been a part of churches that that became their identity, not Jesus, not the gospel, homeschool. You might have been a part of church like that or something else, you know, a cause, some kind of identity that is less than the gospel, less than Christ. And that became your rallying cry. I hope that our one accord, that if someone visited our church, they would say, they love Jesus Christ. They want me to love Jesus Christ too. They are in lockstep, arm in arm on that issue. I bet they have some differences down the list, but on that issue, that is the one accord that I felt and heard and saw at that church. They love Jesus Christ. They love me and want me to love Jesus. They will not back up on the gospel that says that sinful men can be made right with holy God because of Jesus' sinless life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection. This good news must be received in repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not back up one inch on that. But on these other issues, they seem to be willing to, to love each other and work through their differences. So, how are you doing in, in this area of conscience? I mean, on a very beginning level, it, it's wrong for you to just constantly go against your conscience. You know something's right, or at least your conscience is telling you that it's wrong, excuse me, and, but you're doing it anyway. That, let that be a starting point of what you need to hear from this message. It is wrong to disobey your conscience. 
unless your conscience is so out of kilter with God's word that what you think is wrong is what God says is right. And now you need to recalibrate and get your conscience lined up with God's word. So here's a few takeaway points before we say amen. Number one, you are wrong and you must repent if you are sinning to reach sinners. You might not be thinking that, but somebody is going to hear this message and think that. I bet you they heard Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 and thought that. Like, wait a minute, you're willing to do anything to reach anybody? Paul was not saying, I get drunk to reach drunkards. I commit fornication to reach the sexually immoral. No, no, no. Christ does not call you to lose your holiness, but to gain theirs. Number two, you're wrong and you must repent. If you are just so rigid, this morning you got your spiritual arms folded over your chest, sitting back smugly like the, the wooden Indian at the back of the Cracker Barrel restaurant. And you're so rigid and, and unwilling to even pray to be flexible so that you can die to yourself in some preferential areas so that you might win your neighbor to Christ. If you're sitting there smugly saying, I'm not giving up any of my rights, that's their problem. Then that would, Romans 14 was written for you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I have become all things to all people so that I might win some. That indicates that there was a point in time, a decision he made, an intentional strategy to win souls for Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever or you're a struggling believer who has a really sensitive conscience, may I leave you with a word of hope. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23 says that only the precious blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse your guilty conscience. It's the only way. Listen to God's word, Hebrews 10, 19 and following. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Have you stopped to think about that recently? That you, child of God, you, Christian, you have a clean conscience before God. You can put your head on the pillow, go to bed at night and sleep like a baby, knowing it is well with your soul. Your sins are forgiven. They're cast as far as the east is from the west. They're thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. They're under the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What a precious gift. Do you know unbelievers don't have that? Maybe you can remember back to when you were an unbeliever. Your conscience accuses you day and night, and rightly so. There is no rest. There are some who are Christians, but they have a very sensitive conscience. They need to be recalibrated to the Word of God, which is a lifelong process. Let's be patient with them. Let's pray for them. Let's help them. And similarly, their consciences can, can bark at them through the night. But the same cure is for both, and it is 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Turn to Jesus, trust in Jesus, whether it's for the first time or in a fresh way yet again. Remember that this wonderful gift of a cleansed conscience, of forgiveness of sin, of access to God the Father was bought at such a high price. It was bought by the precious blood of Jesus. And back for us for one more moment of giving up things to reach unbelievers. Let, let me say it like this. When Christ and others worshiping Christ with you are your rewards for sacrificing a few preferences in this life, you will say, as David Livingston, missionary to Africa, said when they said to him at the end of his life, what a sacrifice you made. And he looked at them and said, it was no sacrifice it was no sacrifice. I was obeying Christ. I got to lead people to Christ. What you call a sacrifice paled in comparison to what I gained in knowing Christ better and better and finding new brothers and sisters in Christ through the gospel. And that's what you'll say. That's what you'll say. If you sell your Chuck Norris Total Gym and join 24-7 or, or Planet Fitness, and you get to lead somebody to Christ or invite them to church or just find another brother in Christ that you had never known or a sister in Christ, you will not see that as a sacrifice. You will say, what a privilege. What a privilege that is. Well, as I said, there's more meat on that bone, but I just don't have... Time to keep peeling it off. Go back and listen to the sermon in 1 Corinthians 9. It's in our archives. I think that'll help you if this has kind of whet your appetite and you're saying, I, I need some, some more ammunition to fight this fight, to help me die to myself, to help me be patient with one another. I think that'll give you some good, some good nourishment. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that this message has helped each Christian to know that we are going to dif differ, disagree with Christians, solid Christians, but let us show charity and grace and love and patience and let us always have our arms flung open and our front door flung open to say, you're welcome into my house. God forbid that anyone would would feel like they have to leave this church, but if they do, we've, we've rehearsed every month the way to deal with conflict, the way to deal with differences, the way to be reconciled in our hearts with one another. May you help that to be put into practice every day in our families, with our roommates, in our church life. And again, we thank you, Jesus, for your blood that cleanses our consciences. What a gift that is. I pray that everyone here knows that gift. And if they don't, I pray that even now as we sing, they will turn, trust, and treasure Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.